Today we've woken up at the crack of dawn to come out to this solar installation. Why? Because we're checking whether you can add extra panels and a battery to an existing solar system. If you've got solar already and you're wondering, should I add more panels? Should I add a battery storage system? How do you know whether it's worth it or not? Well, that's what we're going to show you in today's video. So make sure you like and subscribe and let's get into it. I feel like a kid, you know. I'm not being crawling around in bushes for ages. Fresh smell of conifer heads in the morning. So our customer here has got a solar array already with this big solar inverter from Solax and a battery storage system from Solax as well. This was installed a few years ago, but the customer is looking to go the next step now into getting rid of the gas boiler, maybe putting in a heat pump or an electric boiler or something like that. But in order to make these kind of decisions, they need the data to be able to tell how much are they producing now? Is that enough to take it up to the next level and come completely off gas? Or do they need more panels? Or would they need more battery storage? And at the moment, they just don't have the, the data that they need. So what we're doing today, we're installing a My Energy Eddy hot water solar diverter. Now they don't have a hot water tank at the moment, but we're gonna use the brain in the Eddy along with the My Energy hub to basically gather data for the next year. And then we'll be able to use that data to see what availability they've got with the current system to be able to run an electric boiler, for example, or a heat pump. Or if they don't have availability, then we can look at adding more panels and maybe an extra battery in order to size the system up to their requirements to be able to run off electric heating. This is the existing solar setup and it looks like they've done a pretty nice job, to be fair. I'm not quite sure what this is. I've not come across one of these before. I think maybe it's like a power optimizer or something, a voltage optimizer. But let me know in the comments if you know exactly what this is. I'd love to know uh, all of your thoughts before I break it. They've also put an additional consumer unit in here for a future electric vehicle charging point, which I think is good. It's sort of quite nice to have that uh, future proofed, but it's not in use at the moment, but it's there kind of ready to go. So we're gonna to have to run in a new circuit for the Eddy and I'll show you how we're gonna do that now. So here in the meter box, the previous electricians who did the solar have installed a consumer unit with an RCD and two 16 amp, oh no, it's a 32 amp breaker for the solar feed and then the existing outbuilding. So I think actually this consumer unit was probably there already to feed the outbuilding and they've basically just added another circuit. And then you've got this armored cable which has been deftly bent around the main service head going down to feed the solar. This armoured cable here goes and just does the normal garage feed. Now they've not got any surge protection here at all and we will be installing a surge protection device today. I'll show you the consumer unit. We'll see if it's neat or not neat. Uh, yeah, it's not, not the neatest. It looks like they've added quite a lot of new wiring, but there is quite a lot of old wiring as well, so it's quite a mixture. Pretty messy, to be honest. That's not really surprising. Most of the consumer units that we look at are messy, unfortunately. But anyway, the good news is we've got a spare way here that we can use for the eddy. Some of the way that they've done the existing wiring is really weird, like they've run the central heating circuit, but then they've run a socket for the Wi-Fi off of that, and they've run a socket for the tumble dryer off of that. So they've done quite a lot of additions over time, and I don't really want to be putting a potential 16 amp load onto an existing circuit that's already got a lot of loads on, so I'm just gonna run in a brand new circuit for it. As always, we have lovely customers who have made us some bacon sal bacon rolls, bacon sarnies. What do you call them? Let me know in the comments. Look at that. They've been watching our videos clearly because there is a theme now. There's definitely a theme of bacon sandwiches being being served to us. Mm, that's good. You even feel a little bit healthy with a, a seeded bun. Those buns outside, they were quite seeded. 
Now I'm gonna throw something out there that's very controversial. I actually prefer brown sauce over ketchup. What's your favorite sauce with your bacon roll? Is it ketchup, HP, daddies, or something else? Let us know in the comments. Mm. So here we have the Myengi Eddy. We've got the Harvey, which is a wireless CT clamp monitoring device basically and the hub which does the internet connection and enables you to use the app um, we've got a ct clamp as well this is the eddy we have done videos about these before so we'll leave a link in the description below where you can have a look but basically it allows you to control two immersion heaters you basically put a ct clamp around the solar and then when excess solar is being generated rather than sending it out to the grid it will use that solar energy to heat the hot water. So that's why it's called a micro generation energy diverter because it essentially diverts that excess energy into heating your hot water and kind of turns your hot water tank into like a heat battery basically to store that energy as hot water. Now, what we tend to do with these, because we have had teething problems in the past with firmware updates and stuff, we tend to connect it up on a plug to start with pair it all up with the hub and the Harvey, connect the hub to the internet, get the firmware updates all done and everything first to make sure that that side all works. Because there's nothing worse than getting it all installed and then finding that you've got signal issues, connection issues, being here until midnight trying to get it all working. So I'm gonna do that now, put it on a plug top, get the hub Harvey paired up, firmware updates done, and then we can crack on with the main install. Plug the eddy into this socket here. Please select if this eddy is first device installed or additional devices. First device installed. Oh, enable V-Hub. Ah, oh, does that mean it does have the hub built into it now? That would be interesting. Internet. Haha, -ha. I was wrong. Let me eat humble pie. And I apologize to Dan publicly because I said to Dan, when he'd, he'd quoted for this job and I said, ah, oh, you forgot to add the hub onto the quote because I thought that the Eddy didn't have the hub functionality built into it, so we needed a separate hub. But it appears that now with the new Eddy, just like the Zappi 2.1, it does have the hub functionality built in, which means we don't need a separate hub. So that is good. So we're gonna see if we can get it connected to the Wi-Fi now. Does it have WPS? Oh yeah, pair WPS at the front there. Okay, so we press that. WPS activate. Okay, initiated. This is what the guys say never works, the WPS thing. So we tried WPS twice, it's not having it. This is like, when I realize what pain the guys go through every time on these jobs, it's like, internet stuff is just always a problem. So I'm just screwing the antennas on to here because I'm thinking that maybe without those, the Wi-Fi connectivity is not as good. So putting those on and gonna try again. So now that I put the antennas on, that worked like a charm. So definitely top tip, make sure you put the antennas on before you uh, try to do the Wi-Fi connectivity because it does make a big difference. We're now connected to the Wi-Fi network and you can just see that because it says there, um, connected, which is perfect. So we're connected to the internet. We've got it set up on the customer's phones now. So they've created their account and paired their account with this device. Now I've got to add the Harvey, but to do that, because the Harvey is self-powered, it actually powers it from the CT. We need to actually go to the meter box and clamp the CT round so that it adds, creates some power, powers this up, and then we can pair it with the Eddy. So we'll do that now. I think we do it like that. So now on here, we've got the Harvey appeared, we've paired that up. If we go into the Harvey menu, we can select which CTs we want. So CT1 is gonna be our grid CT. That monitors basically how much power the house is using. So how much it's importing or how much it's exporting if they're 
generating more than they're actually using and then ct2 is going to be generation and battery because they've got combined um, inverter and battery system so that will tell us how much power is actually coming out from that generation and battery system and that will just give us all the data we need to be able to figure out what the next steps are for the customer over time i've got that music i've got the video music in my head for some reason the music we use at artisan is so catchy i've always got it in my head so for the second ct which is for the solar we've got to basically get that inside this consumer unit for the solar. Now, sometimes you have to drill a hole to get it in. Fortunately, we do have a hole already that we can use. I'm just gonna thread this cable through, but I'm gonna turn the power off to it first because it's, it's a little bit tight in there. Try to avoid getting myself shocked. So for this CT, it's gonna go around this wire here, which is the solar coming in. We always have the arrow pointing in the direction that the current would normally flow, which in this case is in from the solar. So we just clip that clamp around there like that, and then tidy this little cable up, and then we're good to go. Okay, so I'm just temporarily bobbing those in just because I want, I want to make sure that both CTs are reading properly before I fix everything back. That's why I've left the full length on these cables. Obviously I'm gonna shorten them a bit later, but I just wanted to make sure that everything reads correctly and it's working as it should before I do any cutting back of things. You should be able to see the reading from the solar coming in as well as the grid reading now. So now what I do on here is I just check that the CTs are actually getting readings. So I can see here CT1, which is the grid. The house is using about 233 watts of power at the moment, so not a lot. You can see that from the solar and battery, we're generating 1.6 kilowatts. Out of that, we're using 0.3 in the house, which means we're exporting 1.4. So if we turned on a significant load in the house, then obviously more would go into the house and less would get exported. But this is logging all of this data now. So over the weeks and months that come, the customer will be able to see exactly how much they're exporting, how much they're importing, how much they're using in the house and how much they're generating. And then all of that data will be available for us to analyze in a year's time if they want to add a heat pump or an electric boiler or something like that to see if they have enough spare capacity and what the best way to use that excess solar energy would be. So just a little tip with this, which is why I was not getting an accurate reading and why the screen wasn't showing anything at first, is that you need to turn off the internal CT connection of this if you're only using the Harvey. It's set up a standard that the grid CT is CT1 hardwired into this. So in the menu, you have to switch that off. And then in the device menu, you select the Harvey and select the CTs that are connected to the Harvey, then it will all work properly. That was puzzling me for a little while why I can see the grid readings on here, but it was just simply that I had to turn it off from the internal CTs and turn on the, the Harvey CTs. So now I can actually get this mounted on the wall. All that setup process is a bit faffy, but the actual install process is fairly simple. We've got to get a cable from here back to the consumer unit. We'll put it on its own circuit. And we're just going to mount it up here in the corner of this cupboard, run a trunking down from the ceiling, from the loft down here, loop the mains power cable into there. And then this side will be available for the heat pump or the uh, electric boiler or whatever they want to connect to it, a hot water tank, whatever it might be later on. So I'm going to clear this shelf, drill a hole up into the loft, then I can see where we come out up there and then route cable back to the consumer unit. I'm gonna put a double pole switch in for this as well. So I'm gonna come out of the trunking into the side of that, just so that it looks nice and neat. So I'm just gonna mark that up here. So everything's kind of up trunking 
all the bits and pieces next stages to get the cable over to the consumer unit. So I'm just going to put a loose end of this cable up and see if I could see it up at the loft. Otherwise I'll probably have to poke one of those super rods up and just do it that way. Let's go up into the loft and see if I can see that. Oh. Okay, work smarter, not harder. I think we poke a rod up. As we've got a cameraman here who can listen, he can tell me roughly where he thinks it is. And then that'll narrow it down at least rather than it being like a wild goose chase. Because there are loads of cables and loads of junction boxes here. <coughs> yeah? Uh -huh. We have cable. Fantastic. I'm gonna clip it as much as I can. It's difficult when you've got a loft like this because there's wood everywhere, there's insulation everywhere. Ideally, it's better if the cable's not covered in insulation because of heat dissipation. Those days when I'm like, oh, I wish I was back on the tools, I miss it so much. And then days like this happen and I'm like, oh, I wish I was back in the office. Oh yeah, uh, that is that's a good point. So I just dropped my drill bit there. Oh, no. the, um, the question is, how many tools have you lost in lofts over the years? I'd love to know. I have found so many like random screwdrivers and pairs of cutters in lofts over the years where clearly like I was just doing, somebody's been crawling around, it's fallen out their pocket, landed in some insulation and they never, knew about it so let me know what the worst or most expensive tool you've lost in a loft or other tricky place has been oh man i am wearing a jumper which is pretty quite stupid but it is not that hot up here but i'm really out of breath coming back to haunt me that bacon sandwich oh. Oh. but how you know how would you do a job like this without getting into the loft? That's the thing. The answer to that question is, run the cable on the outside of the house. So they just clip the cable on the outside of the house, it looks horrible, and they just do it all in the name of safety. Let me know in the comments, guys, if you work for a company that does not allow loft work. It would be interesting to see how many companies out there are like that. I understand it from a lot of perspectives, but I just think if you're living in the real world, you just gotta mitigate the risk and do it anyway. Builder's bum is seriously on show, which is how to get fired at Artisan Electrics. Number one, have a builder's bum. The only time it's allowed is when filming members only content. We do have a members only section of our channel where we share exclusive stuff that doesn't appear on the main channel, like behind the scenes stuff, extra videos. Go check that out if you want it and just click the join button. In fact, if you, if you want to sponsor a sweaty electrician, then click the join button. So when it comes to clipping twin and earth cable, a couple of little tips that I like to use. Use your thumb to straighten it out. So if you just put your thumb on it, run your hand along it and you can flatten it against the surface that you're clipping it to. The other thing is, how do you know your spacings? Very easy, just use your hammer's length. So, butt of your hammer to the previous clip, head of the hammer to the next clip, and then you know that they're all gonna be the same distance. Obviously check that that's within regs, but usually it's for smaller cables. bite to eat, cooled down from that hot sweaty loft and now we're ready to connect this eddy up at this end so I'm just going to get that switched uh, isolator on the wall there and then get the eddy connected in. have to be either vertical or horizontal for OCD's sake. 
Some people say vertical is the way forward because you don't get any dust going on them. To be a horizontal person, but I'm, I'm definitely more vertical now. So now that we've got our isolator switch on, kind of pop the eddy itself onto its bracket, like so. So that just drops down, and then we've got these couple of little retaining screws. Something to note about the eddy as well is that it's got a heat sink on the, on the back because there's quite a lot of heat that it produces and you need to have airflow because it cools with convection. So you need to make sure that there is an air gap above and below in order to let it cool itself properly. So we're at the board side now, got to add the RCBO and the surge protection device, but first safe isolation. Customer's given us permission to turn off. So we're safe to work. What I've got to do is put this RCBO in for the, for the eddy. And then this surge protection kit is a 40 amp MCB and an SPD. So that will go on the end. We've got a couple of spare ways at the end to put those in. So this RCBO will go in there and then the SPD kit will go in the end. So the burglar alarm's just gone off. This is classic, often old burglar alarm systems when the battery backup is pretty much uh, dead, they go off and we turn the power off and it's really annoying, um, but hopefully the customer can put in the code and it'll calm it down. It's quite nice this SPD kit because it comes with all, all the wires pre-made out to the right length. So the earth goes in the bottom and then line and neutral in the top. So I'm just trying to get this on the bus bar connected up and then we can actually put the bus bar cover back on, liven everything up, and that'll stop the alarm from going off. Trying to wade through a bowl of spaghetti. There's just no way to kind of add cables neatly to a board like this because you're working around the existing. So you've just got to kind of make the best of it really, but it's always slightly frustrating. I've just got to do an R1 and R2 test on this before I actually uh, liven it up, so I'll just do that now. So we're checking two things here. One, earth continuity. Two, the fact that this switch is correct. So turn that on, and then we, go, we get our reading, 0 0.2 ohms, which is for the line and CPC continuity. Turn that off, and then it breaks the continuity. So that's perfect. So we're ready to liven up again. And we have power. So just testing the RCBO that we've installed, just to make sure it does trip. And that does, so that's all good. So it says it's heating, but obviously there's no element actually connected at the moment. I think what we need to do really now is just program it to actually not turn on. So stop mode. So we've put it in stop mode, so it's not gonna actually be switching on and off because there's nothing to switch on and off, but it is gathering the data we need, which is why we've installed it, ready for the next phase later on. We started putting these warranty seals on our work so that we can see if anyone's been tampering with stuff. So if we come back for, you know, to a warranty call out with something wrong and we see that somebody's been tampering with stuff, then we know it's probably their fault. So I'm just shortening these CT cables now that we know that they're all configured properly. Just get them to the right length. I've labelled everything up as well. So everything is supremely neat, which is how we like it here at Artisan Electrics. A little bit OCD about neatness, because you can never label stuff too much, is our motto. The next electrician who's here will thank us, because he knows exactly where everything's going, or she. Because I always get picked up for that. It's the stuff from the bush when I went in the bush. Links we go to to entertain our viewers. So that's it. We have a working eddy gathering data for our customer ready for the future so that they can expand or alter their system to get more out of their solar panels. Add solar panels and more batteries later maybe, but data is key. So if you'd like to know more about us and what we do, there's loads of links in the description. Also, why not grab a cup of tea and watch another video that pops up after this, because we've done loads of solar installations, electric vehicle charging points, other eddy installs. There's a whole plethora of videos. We've got over 500 videos on our channel. So 
we'd love you to watch a few more. And if you haven't done so yet, like and subscribe, it really helps. But either way, thanks for watching and have a great day. Thank you.